an island that has been inhabited for thousands of years. Through its Greek body, conquerors and crusaders have passed. In ancient times, they called it fine wine. They got to know it from its sweet wine. Its land was fertile, rich, with mountains and valleys, waters, rivers and anchorages. The island lacked for nothing. Its people were open, jolly. An island at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. A happy island despite its adventures and conquerors, despite its foreign masters and the difficult years, earthquakes, drought, the wrath of the gods. An island smiling at history and tradition. A crossroads island, values, civilizations, traditions. A modern island, multicultural, that accepts and embraces, as in the past. And today, an island station of services, goods, exchanges. An island carved in stone and limestone. The short-lived passing of people, the carving of the rock, permanent. Many conquerors, Persians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Arabs, Franks, Venetians, Turks, they all leave their mark. The prehistoric settlements of Hilokitia and Lemba open wide the doors of history, 7,000 years ago. A circular stone wall hugs tightly and protects the first Cypriots who build around the river. They build circular houses with fireplaces, floors and roofs. They carve the stone pots and paint the pots made of clay. They make idols of stone, women, animals, houses, weird gods, odd, an ornate world, organized. The island became known in the Mediterranean sea world from the gift of God, copper. Metals, stone, ochre, colors. Copper made the island. It brought it to light. It traveled. It enriched it with knowledge, experiences, aquatic, terrestrial. Their buildings became one with the mountains, the arid valley, stone and soil, stone and life. The Marquis settlement shows the organization of society, the workshops and the houses, the roads and the squares. Copper opens the prospect, the talents are loaded onto the ships and the people travel, they become rich and return to their land wiser. Angami, however, is a great city, the zenith of trading in copper. Alassia of the Pharaohs, 1200 years before Christ. Angami was the port for copper. From this town, with its sanctuaries and houses, the squares and the workshops, copper traveled further afield to Sardinia, to Spain, and its Mycenaean inhabitants, who arrived here in 1200 BC, gave the island new life, new religion, and new skills. The horned god of Engomi is the same as that of the god of the Peloponnese, the warrior god standing on a talent, a sample of unique style. The god is the protector of copper. The god is the protector of Engomi, of Cyprus. We know a lot about the ancient cities and their sanctuaries from the cemetery of the mountains above Little Carinia, a ritual in a closed sanctuary, people, dances, sacrifices. The Cypriots work, they cultivate their land. And the stone becomes a body, a face, a statue, a man, a woman, a figure. From 
Aya Irini of Morfu, the idols and their offerings to the sanctuaries mix west with east. Hundreds of archaic idols, chariots, warriors, dancers. Greek art is identified in the perfect body of Apollo, leader of the muses of Salamis. Mastering copper, objects, helmets. The grandeur, however, belongs to the nature of the place. Virgin forests, mountain peaks, cedars, pine, cypress trees. Life goes on in the ten ancient kingdoms of Cyprus. Ten built cities, dedicated, protected by gods and people, ports, bays and anchorages, an island, and all around it the sea, the winds, and the enemies. The place is blessed. It's protected by Anasa Kiprida Aphrodite. The Afro Yenimeni Venus, the Paphia, Urania, and Pandemi. Her statues everywhere, the protector of women, of love, of birth, of soil. Wholly known is her name. Adoration extended to all the Mediterranean Sea. East of Limassol, a natural fortress, Amathunda, an archaic town, classic Hellenistic, Roman, Christian. A town identified with the port, a commercial center, a meeting point of relations between East and West. In the citadel, a palace, walls protected with gates, Around it, the market and the baths. On the other end of the island is Kition, a Mycenaean city arises from the rule of copper. Two temples with an oblong garden and altars that are still standing. Architecture from carved stones that show the ability and dexterity of Cypriots in building. And that's where the Phoenicians arrive around 850 BC and build the temple of the god Melkart their own god. There, however, where it shows and dominates, the power of stone and marble is Salamis, its glory, its Hellenism, the famous passage of King Evaioras. The gymnasium was built by the Ptolemies, decorated with statues. The market from the era of Augustus, huge with arcades on the sides, and straight-lined, extremely tall Corinthian columns. Everywhere, Greek goddesses, brides, well-formed muses of marble. Greek script at the gymnasium in Palestra. Salamis is one with the metropolis. The Salamis aqueduct brought water to the town from Kithrea. It was stored in a large tank and it was offered for the needs of the residents. Roman baths, swimming pools with cold and warm water offered relief and peace to the people of Salamis. Shells with ornate mosaics decorate the area. That's where the myths and traditions lie. Apollo with lyre and quiver, the Evrotas River, and leaders love for Zeus. The Salamis Theatre is Roman. It's built on level ground, and the auditorium is supported on a built substructure, a stage that accommodates the spirit and creativity of Cypriots. But Salamis becomes Constantia, earthquakes, Arab raids, destruction. Constantia receives the first message from the Lord and builds huge basilicas. 
The stones come from the island of Proconisos of Propontida. Sanctuaries and columns, these days in the light of the merciless sun. A silent city, the first Christians pray. Constantia is now Christian. Next to it, where the Pedieos River used to flow, the tombs of the ancient kings of Salamis. The silence, the other life, the unknown, possibly immortal. The prison and the tomb of St. Catherine, damp and silent. Within its entrails, it hides another world, older, archaic. That is where the Salaminians buried their dead, exactly as Homer described. Except that the opulence that was buried was foreign to Homer. The wealth can be seen from the decoration of the dead, the pain, the hesitation of departure, the faithfulness to the root, to Homer. When the Romans ruled the island, they enriched it with buildings, roads, palaces. There were tombs also in Paphos, royal ones too. Ornate around an atrium carved from rock, man's ambition remains even after death. Paphos was the city of the goddess. Theatres, conservatories, mosaics, villas, and myths and legends written in multicolored stones. In the house of Dionysos, a villa of the third century, the floor of the atrium depicts scenes from Greek mythology, Pyramos and Thisbe, Dionysos and Icarus, and the first to taste the sweetness of wine. The wealth and opulence of the Romans of the third and fourth centuries. The Acropolis was built on stone at Curium that overlooks the sea and the opposite shore. Sanctuaries, palaces, houses, markets, nymphaea, the house of the warrior, the mosaic of Achilles, all with floors of rich mosaic. The creation, a square, a circle, a woman and a measure, the art of architecture. The hypocaust, the baths, the Romans exercised the mind and the body. The ancient theatre that overlooks the water, hears the sea is smaller than the one in Salamis. Sometimes the Romans, instead of a theatre, turned it into an arena and hunted panic-stricken animals. Further down is the temple of Apollo Hilates, the god of the forests. Christianity arrives on the island, it finds a welcoming audience. Its people worship the Virgin Mary and Christ. They build monasteries and chapels dedicated to them with kingly art, or that of the simple people. Both express faith, devotion, giving to God, small chapels and wooden roofed basilicas. Churches with murals from the 11th century. Ias Nicolaus Tisteis, Ipanaia Tisasinu, Ipanaia to Araka. The eyes of the Pantocrator are everywhere. 
And here the stone becomes one with faith. Patience, tradition, labor in his name. Five dome churches in the holy garden of Aphrodite, Aya Pariska V dominates. St. Lazarus in Larnaca, there where the tomb and the remains of the saint were found. The patron saint with the decorated bell tower, like Lefkara Lace, an important Byzantine and idiosyncratic church, just like that of Apostolos Varnavas, the founder of the Church of Cyprus, previously with three domes, changed today. The center, however, of the city and the faith of the Cypriots. The iconostasis is trimmed with gold and is brilliant. Carved wood with the name of the Lord engraved upon it. Valuable icons, the Virgin Mary, Christ, St. Lazarus. These hold the faith and the place. It survived despite the Latin rulers who bought the island from Richard in 1192. But they do not listen to it. They don't understand it. They do not feel for it. They build on the mountaintops of Pentadactylos, St. Hilarion Castle, impregnable, full of legends and tradition. A Byzantine construction, it now accommodates Frankish kings, beautiful princesses and gallant warriors. The lower section houses the bastion with its Byzantine arches. Within the climbing footpath is the middle section, the most important one. This is the one built by the Lucinians, with a vaulted corridor made of carved stone. In front of us, the Church of St. George, built before 965, a Byzantine structure that had a large dome that was supported by eight arches in the central square area. The upper section is found between the two mountain tops. That's where they built the royal apartments. There hid the Regina. She would sit at her window and look out at the sea. There, high up with little Kyrenia as its sole company and the stormy sea of Karamania, Frankish monks arrived Persecuted by Saladin, they built abbeys, palaces. The Latin East finds a receptive audience in the court of the Lucinians. Bella Pace Abbey, an ode to the limestone of Carinia, to the Gothic art of the arch, an ornate decoration in the soul of Pentadactylos. From there, the Latins passed on the message of Christ. Europe is in Cyprus. The only reminder of the East is the palm trees and the branches of the Cyprus tree. Bufavento Castle. On the top, precipitous, impregnable, controls the sea and the valley, reflects the court of the Lucinian and the power of the temporary Latin ruler. Cantara Castle, huge with apartments and gardens, battlements and dungeons, and their love affairs, intrigues and plots. There, high up in the battlements and in the dark dungeons, the history of the country is set out. The merciless persecution of the Orthodox Christians. They govern the place, however, by sea and by land. The Latin rulers remain and establish their presence. But not for long, clouds fill the sea and the sky. 
the Ottoman threat comes to the Mediterranean. The first to fall is the capital of the kingdom in 1570. The Venetian walls fall. Walls that were the prototype of European fortification architecture. Eleven bastions with the names of eleven great Nicosia families. A deep moat, a city encircled with three gates that opened with sunrise and closed with sunset. That of Amohostos was the most beautiful. Hagia Sophia falls also, the grand cathedral church. There the kings of Cyprus are crowned, the building that reflects their power, but also the power of the Pope and of Rome. Carved and decorated by master craftsmen of Nicosia, Syria and Cilicia. Arches and very high rosette windows, columns from an older building. On its ceiling, in its glory days, Gold stars shone on a dark sky. After its fall on the 4th of September, 1570, Hagia Sophia becomes a mosque, as does St. Catherine with its vertical windows. Amochostos is the queen of cities, the trade of the east, the town of 365 churches. It resists for a whole year, closed within the walls first made by the Franks and then the Venetians, and they're carved in rock, squares, the palace of Caterina Cornaro, and next to it, the Franciscan monks pray. In the central square opposite the king's palace, is the cathedral church of Ayas Nikolaos. When the state was at its glorious zenith, this is where kings of Cyprus were crowned, of Armenia, of Jerusalem. It is said that it's a true copy of the Gothic church in Reims in France. Rose windows, three arched entrances, statues, ornate decorations, a very tall church, different from the humble churches of the Orthodox. Here, height dominates obscurity. The divine is distanced from man. Next to it, Ios Iorios of the Greeks, the cathedral church of the Orthodox in Amochostos. Dated around 1370, three aisles lead to a central elevated point of one and two sided semidomes aisles with five openings that are supported in circular columns of huge dimensions. Today only the foundations remain. The eye is drawn to the high windows around memorial chapels. The whole interior of Ios Iorios of the Greeks was covered in frescoes. Frescoes of the 16th century, certainly the work of an Italian craftsman. Today they're lost in the light. Church of St. Peter and Paul, a church that looks like Ios Iorios of the Greeks, the same dimensions, the same method of construction. A strange building, huge, sturdy, between the Orthodox and the Latin. A peculiar architecture, ours and theirs. Next to it, the Royal Palace. Only its garden remains. The floor with the windows, Catherine left, crying and handed the town over to the Venetians. The brave citizens of Amohostos held on with Mark Antonio's Fragadinos. Martinego, a bastion, a triumph of fortification architecture of the 16th century. For months they lived behind the bastions, behind the stones, and waited. 
The moat hugs the walls tightly. Sometimes seawater separated the town from the outside world. At the entrance to the port, Othello's castle, on its own to face the enemy that would be coming from the sea. The Venetian lion could not save the city. Hordes of Ottoman attacked it day and night, by sea and by land. Frightened, the women ran panic-stricken and hid in the sunless rooms. But the damage was done. The town fell. The churches became mosques. The foreigners left. The Christians were driven out and created a mohostos. The Ottomans remained on the island for 300 years. The people put up with it and continued their difficult life. Palaces and mansions were built in Nicosia to house the new Effendis. The house of Haji Yorgaki Cornesios, the dragon man, an old medieval building, was renovated, modified. It became an example of architecture of the 18th century, with sunrooms, living rooms, proud arches, decorated, ribbed, intricate wooden ceilings. of the east with valuable carpets, multicolored nargiles and suites, carved and painted ceilings. The sovereign at a distance at the end of a room to remind of past glories. That is where the powerful dragoman would receive his guests. And the towns would grow. Lefkasia with its market was the capital. Lemassos with its port pulsated with life a walk on the wharf, the internal city, and the markets. Amohostos lost its port, it lost its significance and its splendor. Larnaca, with the consulates, held on to the Europeans and grew, it developed, whereas Paphos continued to be small and insignificant, and little Carinia, the most beautiful of all. The architecture of the houses and the towns was simple but beautiful. The continuous structure gave security to the residents. Small gateways, the houses touch one another. The small openings designed for the long, drawn-out summers. On the roof, wooden pavilions and windows, stone and wood working seamlessly. At the entrance of every house, an ornate iron decoration bearing the date of construction. The residents are enclosed within their houses, hardly any glances to the road. Life is within. The internal gardens have palm trees and jasmine worlds closed within themselves, sunrooms and arches, stone ponds, internal staircases, upper floors facing the west and the prevailing wind. Houses that reflect life. The town is one family. The neighborhoods raise generations. Stone houses in narrow alleyways, all made of limestone. Capitals everywhere, carved, ornate, that hide the patience and expectations of freedom. At the Salt Lake in Larnaca is the Umm Haram Mosque, the aunt of the Prophet, who fell there from her horse, a holy place for the Muslim residents of the island. A forest of palm trees encloses the mosque, and within this mosque, is the holy stone which is an amulet against evil.
The towns receive the visitors at the inns, the squares, where the farmers dismount with their livelihood for sale at the markets. Others get on with their indolent lives, coffee from the east, the philosophy of life. The large inn in Nicosia is where everybody meets, an amazing structure of the 16th century that was built in 1572 by Muzaffar Pasha, the first Ottoman governor of the island. A beautiful two-story building built with limestone around a large central garden, the 67 rooms of the upper floor accommodated Nicosia's visitors. On the ground floor, shops, stores and offices to accommodate the needs of the inn. But life is not only in the cities. The beauty of the world of Cyprus lies hidden in its nature, in the snowy mountains, in the forests, in the valleys in spring. On the mountainsides with their tall poplar trees, in the sound of the water, that is where the beauty of Cyprus flows. The water, the life of the place, its unique sound. At the Evrichu mill, the water brings life. A stone-built fortress in the colours of the place. The stones of the river, the stones of the mountain, the open arches. Moments of unrivalled beauty at the Chelafos bridge, at the arches, at the Scala aqueduct. The water flows just like life. In the small mountain villages, stone-built, in Cacopetria, in Galata, narrow streets, buildings made of stone, wood and mud bricks. The beauty and simplicity of the natural materials are the characteristics of our local architecture, local knowledge. Picardu, a small village outside Nicosia. Stone geometric volumes in shades of grey and ochre. Logs, thick wood, straw, clay tiles. Internal gardens with ovens. Exteriors that prevent unwanted glances. An ode to traditional architecture that stood the test of time and weather. Internally, with fireplaces and carved plasterwork, birds, grapes, flowers. Architecture that meets the needs of the people. Basements, storerooms for wine, small areas but ornate, with carved wooden ceilings, floors in the marble of the area that are cool in the summer and retain the warmth in the winter. The centre, the soul of every village, the church. The houses around, the tiled roofs, all encircled in green, with jasmine and roses. In the Limassol district, the wine villages of Arsos, Lofu, Kilani, Vasa. The villages are built on the sunlit sides of the hills and look like fortresses. They become one with the land. They retain the traditions and the beauties of the place and produce the sweet wine. What dominates in local architecture is the scale, respect for nature. Wonderful buildings and unsurpassed, as are the structures of our vineyards. 
This craft heritage and the taming of the stone, of wild nature, work and sweat, collecting, storing, building. The art of construction passes from father to son. This is the architecture of Cyprus. Mud, straw and stone, wood and tiles. That is where the birds roost, as does man, in a familiar environment, welcoming and true. That is where he understands the wisdom of simple people and of simple things. The urban architecture of Limassol, due to its cosmopolitan port, acquired another dimension. In the century that has passed, it built houses and mansions that today constitute the pride of the town. Decorations, details, figures, wreaths and garlands ornament the facades of the houses. Limassol absorbed influences from European centers and its houses have an unmatched wealth. These are also carved from the stone brought in from Kividis, which is close by. Craftsmen came from Greece and carved the stone. They brightened it and that in turn brightened the entire town. The east is no longer here. Here a different kind of breeze blows, a European one, a Greek one that gives wings to the second capital. Private homes, the Museum of Folk Art, Pilavakis's house, which is now a library, a structure from Paris, European style, Baroque and Rococo. Examples of urban architecture are also found in the wider area of Nicosia. And here there are private homes, a whole street of examples of unique value. Gladsonov Street in Nicosia is the ultimate in the art of stone. The capital, the arch, verandas for the hot summers, shells for flowers, Corinthian columns, balconies for the long drawn out summers. Only time has changed the feel of the limestone. The hard work and sweat of the craftsmen who carved it is still there. The neoclassical schools are an embodiment of the Greekness of the place built with donations from rich Nicosia people. The Pan-Cyprian Gymnasium, the first school, the pride and joy of Nicosia. The Panoromeni All-Girls School, possibly the most beautiful one within the Nicosia walls, with a tradition in education and morals. On the other side of the island, in Paphos, one road bears all the history of the place. The neoclassical schools of Paphos, unadorned with the marble busts of teachers, places of education and training, places that exemplify the manifest determination of the nation, places that brought up generations of Cypriots, whereas the place was governed by the English colonialists. A classic example of the place's colonial architecture is the presidential palace in Nicosia. The first building was burnt during the October incidents in 31. Another one was built in the same place and this was also limestone. It was decorated with the royal coat of arms, a building that's trying to blend the Gothic arch with the Ottoman bow, the sunroom with the arches. Entire arches were transported from Panaia to Sodikitrius church and were set up in the garden. Their architecture reflects their policy, dividing the place, the divide and rule styles from all eras. At the same time, a Cavafiesque building wounded the heart of the Venetian de Villa Bastion. The fairground that was built here in 1930 subsequently housed the Apoel Sports Club and then the municipality of the capital.
The English colonialists built many things, and not only in the capital. In Limassol, they constructed administration buildings. In Larnaca, at the end of the square, they constructed buildings and warehouses, all of which are characterized by a medley of styles. Wooden pavilions, arrows and arches, medieval, Ottoman. Private citizens built two-storey and three-storey mansions with ornate balconies. And time passed, and a new century arrived. The 20th century tamed the materials, welcomed the concrete, this blended material that allows height and elasticity. There are no longer limits and hurdles for modern architecture. Neotolemos Michaelides a pioneer and a pillar who sang the praises of mud brick but built in concrete, dared at a very young age to build blocks of flats, which was an achievement for his time. It is a fact that it's every architect's dream to create. The young study abroad, get to know new possibilities, the new styles, new views. The towns grow. Ornate blocks with new materials make up the new housing. And here, the main elements are concrete, steel, glass, aluminium. The buildings no longer coexist, competing with each other, challenging, marking a new era. The mud brick disappears. Houses are built with new material. Today's society demands something different. Architecture is a faithful reflection of it. Houses are no longer what we knew. They correspond to today's needs, demands of time, new technologies. Here, the final say is given to abstraction and geometry, a game with volume and colors. The large openings accept and diffuse much light. The 21st century is daring. The lines abandon the horizon. The buildings take off. Nothing holds them to the ground. Architecture is an aesthetic creation. Public and private structures compete with one another and are daring. The materials and the volumes play between squares, oblongs, rhomboids, wood, concrete, glass. Architecture becomes a game of reflection. The internal becomes external. Stone continues to cast its spell. Technology offers the dream and the architect utilizes it. Getting away from lines, one volume succeeds another. The horizontal combines with the vertical. The total, however, casts a spell, impresses, takes off. Modern architecture does not compete with nature. It positions it in between and tames it. The coastal front of Oroklini offers peace, a prospect to blue, a walk. The material is calm, neutral and totally modern, on the same level with the earth, the sea, the environment. In the towns, however, the challenge is different. Glass towers are erected. Architecture reaches for the sky. It leaves. It becomes transparent, circular, inclined, level, perpendicular, at times alluring. Man, the architect, has no limits. He has abilities, imagination, knowledge. He has tamed the material entirely, and he places it at the disposal of modern life. Because architecture is bold, it is the love of geometry, of the line and the curve. It is proof that man has tamed nature, the power the, and creation, just as the anonymous craftsman depicted it at Curium on the 5th century mosaic floor. The creation, wisdom, knowledge, the alpha and the omega of human creation.